गुड आफ्टरनून सर राजीव सर आई एम दिस साइड आरती हेलो हेलो राजीव सर एम आई ऑडिबल गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीबडी वी ऑनरेबल डायरेक्टर एम्स मंगलगिरी डॉक्टर मुकेश त्रिपाठी सर हैज ज्वाइन वी विल जस्ट वेट फॉर फ्यू मिनट्स फॉर अवर डीन सर टू ज्वाइन फॉर वेलकम एड्रेस I request Dr. Namrata, please allow us to share the screen from our side. Sure, we are on it. Yes. In fact, all the panelists have the access to the screen share option. Yes, Maybe you Ma have all the panelists. Yeah. Maybe you have to stop your share screen so that we are at. our end can start yeah thank you i hope it it works now ha ah, yes yes ma'am it's good sure we'll just take 2 minutes more our dean sir is just joining the link
Hallo. Hallo. Ah, ich bin Bauer. Das ist ein guter Typ. Good afternoon, everybody. Today we are having a national webinar on recent advances in prevention and control of hepatitis B and C in collaboration with ILBS New Delhi. We, the team AIMS Mangalgiri, welcome all the participants and the panelists for the webinar. With this, I invite Dr. Joy Goshal, sir, Dean Academics, Head of Department of Anatomy, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Mangalgiri, for the welcome address. Dean, sir, can you hear me? Yes, Arti, I can hear you. Yes, sir. Good afternoon to all the delegates. Dr. Rajiv Sarin. Dr. Mesh Kapil, Director Eames Mangalgiri, Dr. Mukesh Tripathi, sir, and all the delegates. It is my proud privilege to be delivering the welcome address consecutively that shows that I am one of the coveted persons, although it is self-proclaimed, going over to the basics, approximately every day due to liver cirrhosis or liver cancer, due to paucity of data, the exact burden of disease 
for our country is not established as of yet. However, available literature indicates a wide range and suggests that HAV is responsible for 10 to 30 percent of acute hepatitis and 5 to 15 percent of acute liver failure cases in India. It is further reported that HEV accounts for 10 to 40 percent of acute hepatitis and 15 to 45 percent of acute liver failure. High risk group being pregnant women, healthcare workers, patients of hemodialysis, and HIV positive patients, and patients, those who are having high risk behavior. Coming down and to a boiling point, our approaches should focus on preventive component, diagnosis and treatment, monitoring, evaluation, surveillance and research, and training and capacity building. The preventive component would be focusing on awareness generation and behavior change communication, immunization of hepatitis B, that is the bird dose, the high risk groups, and also the healthcare workers, which is a very important point. Safety of blood and blood products, injection safety and safe sociocultural practices, and safe drinking water hygiene and sanitization and sanitary toilets. So in a nutshell, I've tried to summarize and I welcome you all to this deliberation of equivalent mindsets. Thank you all. Warm regards from Ames Mangalgiri once again. Thank you, Aarti. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your valuable words. And I now take a profound pleasure to invite our Honorable Director, sir, Professor Dr. Mukesh Tripathi, sir, Director Ames Mangalgiri, who is also Additional Charge Director of Ames Bhuvaneshwar. Sir, he was Professor and Head, Department of Anesthesiology. Uh, is, uh, he is having over 33 years of career in teaching and research. So was medical superintendent and professor and head in Ames Rishikesh and in SGAPGI Lucknow. Sir has been a recipient of numerous awards and honors and the most renowned one is Uttar Pradesh Ratna in September 2015. Sir is fellow of National Academics of Medical Sciences and has numerous research articles published in various national and international journals. I welcome you, sir, for the keynote address. <clears throat> so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, first of all, uh, this is the second, I think, the session of uh, our collaborative uh, webinars uh, between ILBS and AIMS uh, Mangalgiri. Earlier was one uh, on NFLD uh, was a topic, and uh, <clears throat> I uh, personally know that Dr. Uh, Sareen. Uh, Vice Chancellor of ILBS has tirelessly worked to uh, bring out that ILBS is an institute who is, which is uh, totally dedicated to liver and biliary diseases in uh, uh, government setup. So I welcome him uh, also. Uh, and then I appreciate that uh, Dr. Kapil and they have uh, chosen us uh, as a partner for conducting these uh, webinars. Now, uh, as an anesthesiologist, I know that the, the hepatitis has, is taught to us because we do use a lot of uh, blood products uh, and, uh, of course, the potential uh, uh, needle stick injuries and uh, causing the hepatitis B and C, which, is, uh, which has a hematic, uh, I mean, uh, by blood, uh, it is uh, 
uh, spreading from one person to a person uh, to other person and is a silent killer and uh, silent killer means uh, it is a progressive in nature which uh, gradually kills the liver into and uh, the either the liver cirrhosis is also common and liver cancer can also de uh, develop and almost uh, globally 3000 people die every day from liver cirrhosis or liver cancer but uh, such data is always as always for all other diseases uh, is lacking in india also but a lot of uh, i think uh, dr uh, sarin has taken up this uh, uh, as a you can say the front line runner to find out all these issues raising at a national forum in india and uh, are trying to achieve some data on this and uh, so hepatitis uh, a which is a orofecal root uh, transmission now hepatitis uh, has gone into from a to it has reached up to d and uh, rest all are uh, through blood uh, and idealistic injury and uh, so all the health workers are more prone uh, for uh, this type of hepatitis and uh, i'm happy that a uh, national viral hepatitis control program has been launched by ministry of health and family uh, welfare and uh, the idea is to <clears throat> end the viral hepatitis by 2030 uh, so that is a, a goal of the uh, government of india that it has uh, i mean taken up this as a on a priority basis uh, epidem uh, epidemic of this infection is uh, silent epidemic uh, because many patients are unaware of the infection and gradually the liver gets uh, damaged, remains unrecognized for quite some time. And then sometimes it is detected uh, so late that uh, probably uh, liver transplant uh, is the only answer, which is uh, again has a very costly uh, thing, uh, means uh, cost wise it is not afford, uh, many of the, most of the population may not be able to afford also. So a uh, prevention uh, remains uh, the best component and uh, uh, we, the whole idea of uh, conducting these webinar is uh, to generate awareness uh, and behavioral changes in the community and the communication and the people so that they take uh, immunization of hepatitis B uh, as a um, immunization can only make a difference I think and uh, we have seen this happening in the another viral disease which has taken the whole world uh, as a pandemic and uh, we have seen the fruit so it, now I think it will be very easy to convince the people that immunization for uh, viral diseases uh, will generate an interest of the common masses. So uh, the, the immunization schedule uh, of three doses uh, is being now uh, promoted, which gives 95% uh, protection. And, uh, but uh, I always, uh, here also I try to implement that before uh, giving any uh, hepatitis B vaccination. We try to do anti-hepatitis uh, B titer and if a sufficient uh, um, level is not there, which is uh, more than 10 uh, ml uh, unit per uh, ml uh, is an indicator that uh, the adequate protection is there. Only then we uh, give to our students uh, <clears throat> this uh, vaccination uh, doses. But uh, that is a important uh, thing and uh, now uh, birth uh, dose and uh, hepatitis uh, vaccination of uh, mother is also being promoted so that to get to avoid any mother to child transmission so these are the things which will be probably included in all the national viral health uh, hepatitis control program and uh, that is how i uh, see that uh, the more the we discuss about it and more we per the things are percolated in the society then probably we will be able to achieve our goals of uh, 
ending the viral hepatitis by 2030. So once again, I thank and uh, I'm looking forward for more uh, such uh, webinars being organized in collaboration with ILBS. And uh, right now we are in an infancy phase of our institute and uh, uh, we don't have any gastro medicine uh, as such. So for specialty, uh, nobody has joined us only. Uh, so we will take up this uh, gradually as the uh, faculty and specialty is available to us. Uh, so we will progress, uh, I hope, in a similar fashion. So thank you, Dr. Arti, for uh, giving me this opportunity to express my views uh, in, in this uh, webinar. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your valuable words and valuable time, sir. Uh, we are blessed with your gracious presence. Now I invite Dr. Ekta Gupta, the next speaker for the day. Uh, Professor Dr. Ekta Gupta, ma'am, is MBBS from uh, GSMB Medical College, Kanpur, and uh, is MD from KGMU, Lucknow. Ma'am is Professor and Head of Clinical Virology at ILBS New Delhi. She has been awarded the Best Scientist Award Gold Medal for her outstanding contribution in clinical research by ICMR. Ma'am is also a technical resource person for developing the National Viral Hepatitis Control Program in India. She has multiple extramural research and she is the nodal officer for WHO CC at the Institute. There are many scientific publications and chapters in the book and the main interest areas are hepatitis, transplant virus and dengue virus. Dr. Ekta, ma'am, can you hear me, ma'am? Dr. Namrita, are you there? Yeah, I'm just gonna get in touch with Dr. Ekta. Yeah, sure. So while ma'am is joining uh, the screen, I request the participants to please put your queries in the chat box, which will be taken during the panel session. Also, a link has been sent by ILBS for a pre-webinar survey. I request all the participants to please fill the pre-webinar survey link. Uh, Dr. Ekta is having some connectivity uh, issues. Just give us five minutes, please bear with us. She'll be connecting. Meanwhile, we can take some queries that we see in the chat box. Dr. Ekta is reconnecting and rejoining the Zoom link. So please bear with us. It will take just about two minutes. So meanwhile, some participants are asking whether that uh, pre-survey webinar link can be reshared with them, or maybe that can be posted in the Zoom chat box for the participants, those who could not get it. We'll share the pre-survey links just in their email. And I hope that all the registrations have been done through their emails. So all the survey links and the certificates would be sent in their mailboxes anyhow. So I request the participants to please check your email ID, the registered email ID for assessing the link to the pre-survey webinar. I request uh, all the participants to please check once your registered email ID. You may even check uh, the other uh, spam or other folders. Maybe the mail would have been gone there. To so please recheck. Please. Uh, uh, yeah. I, so you have Ekta, ma'am, here. Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Yeah, ma'am. I'm extremely sorry for the technical glitch I had, although I logged in. Can you see me? Yes, ma'am. You are audible and you are visible. Okay. Ma'am, I request you please share your screen. Yeah. 
Yeah, can you see my screen as well? Yes, ma'am. Uh, please, uh, I request mm -hmm. you to do it in the slideshow mode. Yeah, ha. you are on, okay. ma'am. The presentation is on. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. So, a very good afternoon to all of you. First of all, I must thank the organizers, the Ames Mangalagiri team and the Empathy team, Department of Epidemiology at TILBS, Professor uh, Shiv Sareen sir and Dr. Omesh Kapil sir for uh, keeping this very important uh, lecture and uh, theme as a topic. I would be covering on National Viral Hepatitis Control Program in our country. I am a professor of Department of Clinical Virology, that is microbiology, and also the nodal officer of WHO Collaborative Center of Viral Hepatitis at ILBS. So I'll briefly take you uh, that globally, if you see what happened, why the need for, and why are we doing all these seminars for viral hepatitis is that we felt uh, it was, uh, the data was collected and globally WHO came to know that chronic hepatitis B and C is a bigger problem than HIV, malaria and tuberculosis, as you can see by this graph. So uh, they all came up uh, in uh, 2017 uh, Global Hepatitis Report that something needs to be done for hepatitis B and C infection. Each country has to commit and India was a co-signatory government of India. And uh, so we started doing work towards the viral hepatitis in our country. So what targets they kept for us was that new infections for hepatitis B and C has to be reduced by 30% 2020, 90% by 2030. Unfortunately, we were hit, uh, everybody was this global pandemic. So the efforts towards 2020 targets have not achieved, but now everybody has uh, picked up uh, their threads and started moving towards achieving 2030 targets for hepatitis B and C. The mortality also have to subsequently reduce down. So they kept a lot of um, indicators I think the prevalence uh, person who's going to take the uh, lecture will talk. So uh, uh, what is the baseline percentage and what is the target they have set? So uh, not going into detail, uh, we all know uh, uh, what is the percentage. So the need was felt that B and C diagnosis, see the, the percentage coverage is very, very bad. That is 9% and 30% or 20 and 30%. And we really have to upgrade this. So really everybody, so for, uh, unfortunately, the efforts towards diagnosis or screening of hepatitis B and C were not going enough by each country and everybody has to jump in towards there. So this is again, a um, uh, lot of studies have come out, the Lancet Gastroenterology Hepatology paper, where you can clearly see that what is a divide in the percentage who are diagnosed for B infection as well as for the C infection. So this is where we need more and more microbiology labs to come up and start working in cohesions with the epidemiology people because B and C are a public health approach, a public health problem, and we have to go in sync and start moving towards the um, uh, bringing those targets of WHO uh, of 2030 and so on. So what is the what was the situation in India? So we since we were a WHO collaborative center on viral hepatitis. So 2014-15 um, uh, onwards, we started working before 2017 Global Health Report came. And uh, we felt that A, B, C, D, E, they all are a problem in our country. And it's easiest way to remember by the fingers of your hand. A and E are hyperendemic in our country. Now, these studies are based on actually institutional-based studies, some population-based study, but not very uh, good collection of information is there. But B and C, as you can see, is a far more important problem right now because 40 million people of B are there in our country, 12 million C, but you can see the wide range, 1.1% to 12.2%, in B, the prevalence, and in C, you can see 0.094% to 15. So it depends upon the geographical mapping, the kind of uh, population you have studied. So uh, actually, we felt that we really needed a well-documented hepatitis control program. The information available about the prevalence, the group wise, and the efforts 
can be only done if we come to a conclusive uh, document on uh, making a national viral hepatitis control program. ILBS played a good role. And fortunately, I have been involved with ILBS for the past 14, 15 years. So I was a part of it. Uh, from the very beginning, we what we did was that we uh, brought WHO and Government of India along with ILBS under one umbrella. And 2014 onwards, you will see 14, 15, 16, and 17 on 28th of July, that is the World Hepatitis Day, we did these consultative meetings under the chairmanship of Professor Serene. And uh, we came towards a formulation of a national action viral hepatitis control program in our country. And so, fortunately, on uh, uh, 2000, uh, in 2018, uh, Government of India launched National Viral Hepatitis Control Program. This program is controlled by Government of India, uh, National Center for Disease Control, where uh, uh, directly uh, controls this, and uh, they uh, report to the Secretary of Health Government of India. These are the PDF documents which have been made. They are all freely available. You can see ours is the only country where uh, later on, that is in 2019, February, we also added B to C, but most of the countries, they only uh, focus on C, but we focus on B also. And we managed to uh, persuade our minister to include uh, hepatitis B uh, diagnostics and treatment under the program. So uh, the aim of this program, as uh, so these detailed documents can be uh, easily accessible and you can read uh, uh, what this program is. We, uh, the main aim is that we are going to focus towards elimination of hepatitis C, that's for sure, by 2030. We are going to reduce all the infection, morbidity, mortality to B and C. And A and E component will also be looked after in this program through some other program. I'll let you know. So this is the organogram of this National Viral Hepatitis Control Program in our country, uh, which comes under the Government of India through National Health Mission. So at the national level, you have a National Program Steering Committee, which comes under National Health Mission. We have a, uh, a NVHMU unit. So there are technical resource groups which have been made. One is for operational surveillance, treatment and diagnosis. And fortunately, I'm a part of uh, two of these such national level uh, technical resource group. And this, as I told you, is governed by the uh, Secretary Health Government of India. And uh, NCDC has a major national disease control, Center for Disease Control has a major role to control the uh, funding and implementation of this program. Now at each state, uh, this again will go to the state health mission each state will have the state health mission. Each state, it will be, there'll be a, a, a nodal officer appointed. Uh, if it is not there, then you can go and approach your state health mission to appoint one. Depending upon the prevalence, the geographical mapping uh, in your state, you can have state, um, one state lab, two state lab, you can have model treatment centers un under this program. And all this workup of organization, et cetera, will be done at the state level. And each state will control um, this treatment and diagnosis of hepatitis B and C and H, A and E at the sub-district levels, right up to the health wellness and community health center level. So this is how this program has been done. So what has been done is that this, this has been made, the resource group has been made, the states have been contacted, they have been told to make these things and eat wherever the state has taken up, like Haryana, Punjab, Delhi state has also taken up, Uttarakhand, we have made these um, uh, labs and treatment centers, and we are working on now make district centers and dispensement of drugs and diagnosis. So this work is going on. It started in 2019, but uh, because of the COVID pandemic, the work got delayed in many of the states. So uh, I think it is uh, ongoing at a lot of uh, states have started working in this direction. So how the diagnosis and treatment will be focused under this program, we are going to just depend upon screening because you want to pick up more and more paper person who are diagnosed and uh, confirmed with the infection. So we are going to use easy to do card tests, which are rapid diagnostic card tests, so that uh, the storage is not a problem, performance is not a problem, and they can be get, uh, given at the sub-district levels. However, all 
RDTs have to be confirmed by the molecular test wherever, uh, whenever they are positive and by RNA, HBV DNA and HCV RNA. Uncomplicated cases, that means those who have a healthy liver and they are infected with BNC, will be can be managed up to the level of just your sub-district levels. However, for the complicated cases, means those who have cirrhotic liver and any other co-infections or any other kidney disease and infection, they should uh, be managed at the level of the model treatment center. So each state should have model treatment centers of made which can manage these complicated cases. And otherwise, the testing by RDTs and confirmation by RNA DNA should be available at even the sub-district levels. They have to make arrangement. And kits uh, procurement and drugs procurement can be done at the state health mission from the national health mission. And uh, uh, this is how, but they have to identify the centers where they have to do all these things, testing and test, uh, uh, give dispensement of drugs. Briefly, the rapid diagnostic tests that I have told you are the card test, the lateral flow through or lateral flow card test, and they are very cheap. Uh, they cost about 30 to 40 per test. Uh, however, in case of discrepancies, the confirmation has to be done at the model uh, uh, testing lab by ELISA or CLIA-based assays. And confirmation of all infection has to be done by a viral load testing test, uh, which is RT can be RT-PCR or it can be any simple PCR assays. Genotyping uh, is optional because now you have pan-genotypic drugs for both C and you already have uh, good drugs for B. So you do not require, it is not an essential test. It can be done only in few drug treatment failure cases. So this is uh, the proposed model of uh, uh, testing is there, diagnosis is there, that at the primary health sub-district levels, the RDT will be made available. The district should uh, lab should have uh, avail uh, availability of ELISA and RT-PCR. And thanks for COVID that I think all the district level labs in medical colleges, they all are now um, uh, trained to do these uh, PCR assays. The state level and the uh, center of excellence should have better tests available with them in case of to resolve the um, uh, 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 discordance by CLIA assays. And then they should, the facility of sequencing, et cetera, would be present at the APEX lab in each state. This is how the treatment uh, dispensation is proposed under this program that at the sub-district level you should have a facility where the drugs can be dispensed and follow-up of the patient can be done. So you should give monthly or weekly drugs and then you should have records, data entry operators where you can follow them up. At the district hospitals, uh, you should be able to take care of all uncomplicated cases. So what we want in these uh, district hospitals, that basic ultrasound, fibroscan facility, and uh, biochemistry, because you need to do a LFT, you have to get an ultrasound done to differentiate for serotic, non serotic So that basic kind of a biochemistry, microbiology, and radiology facility, if it's there, then you can uh, easily manage all uncomplicated cases. Now, what uh, expectation is from a state level or a model treatment center is that they should be able to manage even the complicated cases. I mean, they should have a good endoscopy services available, a gastroenterology unit. They should have uh, provision for um, invasive uh, interventional uh, radiology if you need a biopsy, or you should have sophisticated <clears throat> Uh, if it is good that if you can also make a transplant center, then that's well and good. But the requirement is that a tertiary level site will only become, and there should be only one in each state, and you do not require. Uh, so where the complicated cases can be managed, and uh, there all their investigations can be done at free of cost. Now, what are the challenges we anticipate? We have made this program. We have made the diagnostic algorithm, treatment algorithms, who to become what. The problem is linkage and continuity. So that work has to be done at each state with, in coordination with your state health mission or whosoever is looking after your health in your state. Because you should have uh, where 
person is tested. You're not going to, anybody who gets enrolled into this program should remain into the program till the entire treatment is given. You're not going to lose on, like the NACO, like the HIV program. You stick on to the patients. So the linkage and continuity is a big problem we are anticipating. And then uh, more microbiology labs, which are equipped to do PCR assays, should be there because largest drop-off occurs when you first screen by an RDT, a patient who comes out to be HBV or HCV positive, but they never turn up because the PCR facility is not there. So their viral load is not done. And hence the cascade of treatment is not started with them. So these are the problems we, and the management of complicated cases is also a problem uh, that each state should have at least one facility where the complicated cases easily to this enrolled. I briefly touch upon the guidelines, what we are going to follow in this B and C. So hepatitis B virus, am I audible? Uh, still audible? If I can hear. Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Okay, okay. So uh, hepatitis B virus is a DNA virus, we know, and the there are a lot of important markers by which you can uh, pick up the infection. Surface antigen, which is an antigen onto its surface, is a very important good marker which tells you about infection and which is a good marker and remains in the blood by which you can actually uh, uh, have assays to uh, confirm the infection of hepatitis B. The DNA is another marker, HBV DNA, which needs to be done in the algorithm of uh, 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 treatment uh, cascade. So there are a lot of other markers as a microbiologist, antibody to E, anti, uh, e antigen, core total, but in our program, we use, because whenever you have a public health program, the minimal uh, test markers that with, with which you can run your program are needed. So HBSAG and HBV DNA for hepatitis B virus are two important markers on which we are going to rely on most of the testing and treatment. Now, most of the infection, uh, this is just a, a slide to show you the natural infection of hepatitis B. As we know that acute infection is not a problem, but because uh, if a person acquires hepatitis B infection, then it is less than 5% chance that he will land up into chronicity person is immunity is able to clear the virus. But it is the mother to child transmission by which more than 95% will land up into this chronic infection. And hepatitis B virus goes and gets integrated into the host genome. So it resides there lifelong. And then you cannot clear. And then it it remains in the inactive carrier state or low replicative phase for a long time. And then ultimately when it starts reactivating it immediately the cirrhosis and or chances of HCC rises. So one important step of prevention, that is if you give at birth or birth dose vaccination, this uh, transmission can be stopped. And so our problem of hepatitis B can be taken care. But right now, uh, what we focus more on picking up these cases and putting them into cascade of care. So in hepatitis B virus, as I told you, if it is an acute infection, the virus gets cleared from the blood within six months. So here we are only talking of blood because we do not really know whether it goes and reside, has gone and resided into the liver. Uh, there. But if the person is able to clear HPSAG, HPV DNA within six months, we call it acute infection. Uh, it is usually asymptomatic in less than one person may present as acute viral hepatitis or acute liver failure. The problem is of chronic infection. When the virus uh, 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 particles, that is in the form of infection, that is HPSAG DNA, persists for beyond six months, then it becomes a chronic infection. And then uh, you may have a low replicative phase, but very soon the person's liver starts getting cirrhosed. Earlier part is that cirrhosis is compensated by the body, but once the decompensation process sets in, and then there is a chance of the liver failure and further uh, uh, acute mortality or any kind of adverse. So under the program, uh, HBSAG, as I told you, we're going to depend upon very minimalistic markers. So HBSAG has to be offered to 
all. So under this program, uh, we are going to do a card test for HPSAG to anybody who wants to come and gets enrolled into the program or just like that comes and gets screened. Now, once a person is HPSAG posi uh, is positive, you just have to do certain basic tests to understand whether the person's liver is normal or not normal. Because I told you complicated, non-complicated. So cirrhosis is one of the criteria we're going to look for. Now, if HBSAG positive and person's liver is cirrhosed, you have do not go for any other test. You have to initiate antiviral therapy. And this once the antiviral therapy is initiated, it is a right now the drugs available have to be given lifelong. And if the person is put on uh, treatment, then three monthly you have to follow him up with an HBV DNA test. Now, if the person liver is normal, HBSAG positive, then we're going to do the ALT test and look for the age. Now, if ALT is abnormal and DNA is also very high, you have to initiate treatment. Treatment can be deferred and patient can be monitored if ALT is normal and DNA is less than 2000. So if your ALT is uh, 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 less than 2000, or sorry, uh, is normal and your DNA is less than 2000, you can defer the treatment and you can monitor calling the patient once a year and get an ALT and DNA to see whether he comes into the category of treatment. So this is as per the WHO guidelines and the similar guidelines have been adopted as it is in our national program. What are the drugs? So under the program, you have these uh, tenofovir, entacavir available. Uh, both the formulation of tenofovir, that is uh, TDF and TAF, both are available under the program. And they have to be given at free of cost. Uh, your state health mission has to make, procure these drugs from the national health mission, and they can be made available and can be given to the patient. Now, this is a, just a flow through how a person who comes to a model treatment center, you just, the same way as I've told you, you get an HPSAG done, get the other investigations done to know whether cirrhotic, non-cirrhotic, depending upon which category, you make the treatment card and then you can just, whatever free drugs are there with you, you have to give to the patient and keep calling for monitoring because these are lifelong drugs. So the follow-up and adherence to treatment is very, very important in hepatitis B virus infection. Now, hepatitis C virus is a simpler virus. It's an RNA virus. It has got uh, only one. Uh, so the test we are going to depend upon in this program is for confirming exposure to infection, antibody to HCV. So you do not have antigen available in uh, hepatitis C virus, although there are new studies which are coming up, but uh, largely we are going to depend upon antibody. Now, this antibody is not the protective antibody. The antibody to HCV tells you about exposure to infection. Confirmation of an ongoing infection is done by an HCV RNA test. Normally, in a person, once you acquire an infection, 20 to 30 percent chance that body on its own will clear. Now, once your RNA is cleared from the blood, the antibody may remain, then that is known as an acute HCV infection, which is asymptomatic and very difficult to pick up because since it is very asymptomatic. Now, in 70% chance that you do an antibody test who is antibody positive, RNA will also come positive. And such are the cases. We call them as chronic infections. And then we have to treat. So any RNA positive patient has to be treated. So the uh, algorithm goes, they are very, it's much, much simpler than B. You don't have to do many assays. You just have to screen by antibody to HCV. If the person is positive, you just confirm presence of RNA by doing an RNA test. RNA test can be qualitative or quantitative, but tell you qualitative assays have got very high lower limit of detect. Means if a quantitative assay can detect up to 20 copies, the qualitative assays can detect up to 200 or 300 copies or more or 1000 copies. So it is good to have a quantitative assays. Nowadays, the cost is also uh, not much. Core antigen assay, if you have standardized in your lab and you are very good and your clinicians are happy with this assay, then that also you can do. So anything by which mere antibody is not there and ongoing infection is confirmed, that test is done and then you have to put the patient on treatment. 
and the drugs which are available. So there are, uh, we know the virus has got NS5A region, NS5B region, and you have a protease inhibitor region. So the drugs which are direct acting antivirals, so gone are the days of interferons. We give direct acting antivirals, which directly block the replication of the virus. The drugs which act on the B region of the virus are named with buvirs. You can see so for so buvir, Voxilla, you know, these are uh, buvirs are the DASA buvirs are the B inhibitor. The drugs which act on the NS5A region are known as asavirs, like daclatasvir, velpatasvir. So a combination treatment is given in hepatitis C, B, and A region. With uh, without cirrhosis, you just have to give for 12 weeks. With cirrhosis, you have to extend and you have to give a better NS5A. So this, all these drugs are available. And only thing you have to uh, put, categorize the patient to which category they belong. The HCV treatment, uh, RNA is tested once uh, at the start. And since this is a time-bound treatment, like hepatitis B is an ongoing, so you have to do annual testing. Here, you just have to do one-time RNA testing. Once you have completed 12-week course, then wait for 12 week, and then a sustained virological response is calculated by doing an SVR12 test. There is no need for doing an on-treatment on lab monitoring. Genotyping is also not uh, mandatory for all, only in case of certain treatment failures or complicated cases, you need to know the genotype to start an interferon treatment. You need to uh, type the virus. So this is a very simple algorithm. A person walks in, you have to do an anti-HCV test. All anti-HCV to be sent for a viral load, any viral load to be treated, You depending upon the uh, algorithm I've shown. So this completes B and C. E-virus, uh, we are not going to do the management of E-virus under the program, but just for the diagnosis. And you all know HEV RNA, um, it's uh, whenever you have HEV virus, you will have an acute ongoing jaundice. It's an acute viral hepatitis. And so IgM assays, which are simple uh, serological assays, are very good because they match with your derangement of LFT. So by this assay, you can HEV IgM test, you can pick up an acute HEV infection. Similarly, for hepatitis A, uh, usually the diagnosis is not done because it's the most important cause of acute viral hepatitis, but HAV, IgM-based assays, they match very well with the clinical sign and symptoms. So just for the etiology or uh, this thing, HAV, IgM is the only test on which we're going to depend. So this is the proposed algorithm. If your patient is acutely jaundiced, then for A, E, B, and C, we are going to do all serological markers and uh, A and E, just IgM, so that you categorize that it is E or A, whatever, for the uh, data purposes, no management, um, uh, because uh, it's a, uh, on its own self-resolving infection. You just have to manage symptomatically the patient. B and C, you have to manage as per the algorithm I have already discussed. Now, in case a person is non jaundiced, that you know it's a chronic infection, then we are going to only focus on BNC. So, a non jaundiced person, only BNC. For a jaundiced person, A, E, B, and C. Now, D, we have not included in the program because we know the prevalence of hepatitis D in our country. We have also done quite a lot of studies, is coming out to be less than 5%. So, um, um, B is not included right now, only in complicated. Uh, sorry, D is not included, only in complicated B infection, where you really want to understand for the management, then you can do go for a hepatitis D virus uh, diagnosis. So this is in a nutshell, what is this program and how it is going to function. Now, what we have to do is find cases, link them to care. What, uh, as a part of like Delhi State, I can say that we started that, um, uh, let us start some decentralized testing approach. So I'm just sharing that we did some preliminary study for Delhi and it's a very feasible uh, uh, work. We showed to the government that it can be done. So we actually screened for 38,000 patients uh, and uh, by RDT and RNA was tested. And uh, actually the treatment initiation was done in more than 80%. And this is, I'm talking about all 11 districts of Delhi. So where um, uh, the screening was done, the confirmation was done, and we actually initiated them 80% uh, on treatment and they became eligible and they completed and they were cured 
uh, also 95.5. So it is a very well doable only, uh, program. We showed this model in uh, Delhi and now we are implementing the Delhi state viral hepatitis control program that yes, by simply connecting uh, district sites, the Mohalla clinics, where the screening is done, the R providing an RNA. Now, in this study, we ILBS did all the RNA testing for them. But if you provide RNA in these districts, that uh, this dropout would also be uh, prevented. See, from 91 to 86, uh, I mean, uh, you could have, we could have enrolled more patients. So, uh, uh, this is just a uh, study that we have done and I would like to share. Now, what is the current status of this program is that 710 centers have been uh, right now functional. Many states have taken now, but still because of uh, the COVID, the, there was a, a lag and everybody is starting to build up that lag. So just to summarize that in order to meet the ambitious targets of 2030 and uh, the National Viral Hepatitis Control Program has been launched in our country in 2018, uh, we need to enhance the diagnostics so that the testing is offered more to the general population. And each state has to make their own plan and put the proposal to their state health mission and start coordinating uh, towards this National Viral Hepatitis Control. I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, it was a very elaborate and uh, in-depth uh, talk about hepatitis uh, B and C, and there we got a lot of new updates uh, also. So with this, uh, we'll move uh, to our with this we will move to our next speaker, Doctor Professor Doctor Sumitra Sir. Sir is the professor and head department of clinical microbiology and infectious disease, Ames Mangalgiri. Sir is having over 45 research publications and has been a uh, known resource speaker in various national and international uh, professional forums. Sir was an MD gold medalist and has also received other awards, IAMM national awards for best paper in bacteriology, IAM Delhi chapter awards for best paper in AMR and AST, and so more. Sir is an editorial board member for Indian Journal of Med Microbiology. And the interest areas are AMR, AST, WHNet, antimicrobial stewardship, parasitology, and infectious diseases. With these words, I cordially invite Dr. Sumitra Sir for the talk. Sir, am I audible, sir? Yeah, am I audible, Dr. Arti? Okay, uh, I'm sharing my screen. Sir, you are not audible, sir. Uh, hello? You are audible, sir. Yeah, okay, thank you. So I'll just uh, share my screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is visible, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. R.P. And uh, thanks to the Department of uh, Community and Family Medicine and uh, uh, ILBS for organizing this national webinar on the recent advances in prevention and control of hepatitis B and C. As uh, you have uh, read out my credentials, uh, the speaker, the participants would know that probably I'm the outlier over here because my main core area of interest has been AMR and AMSP. However, uh, um, uh, Dr. Ekta has been a huge source of inspiration for uh, all of us in, the, in clinical microbiology. Uh, uh, the amount of work that she's done in hepatovirology is uh, really awesome. And uh, I, it's a very, you know, it's an honor to say, share the screen and the stage with her the, uh, on this uh, particular webinar. Uh, most of the technical uh, uh, technical diagnostic part and the uh, control programs have already been uh, you know highlighted by her uh, i'll be just uh, you know uh, mentioning brief things about regarding what is the burden of hepatitis b and hepatitis c in india uh, as of today so uh, if we go on to the few basics uh, that ma'am has already mentioned that you know among all the hepatitis viruses or the hepatotropic viruses uh, hepatitis B is the only virus which is a DNA virus and other are all, uh, uh, you know, uh, RNA viruses. 
uh, B and C are of particular interest because uh, they are parenterally transparent and A and E are uh, primarily by the orofecal root and water and all these, uh, 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 you know, by the orofecal root is the main source of transmission and whereas parenteral uh, uh, sources through B and C, so that's so that they are uh, not only preventable infections and uh, in case of hepatitis B, it is of course it's a vaccine preventable disease as well. And why we need to know is that because we need to understand the global and the regional epidemiology and the burden uh, of uh, both of these uh, parenteral hepatotropic viruses with, with respect to the mode of transmission, which is primarily parenteral, as I mentioned, and what are the most affected populations, what are the risk groups, like Mav has said that there are there's a huge uh, national viral uh, hepatitis control program uh, that's ongoing. So we need to also target what are the groups that uh, which most get uh, get affected by hepatitis B and C, and what is the natural history and the you know in vivo replication pattern, how it divides, how it persists in the body, and what kind of serological markers it keeps on releasing in the blood, uh, so that can, we can we can pick up whether you want to pick up antigens or you want to pick up antibodies, which are the more sensitive markers to, you uh, know, uh, to capture whether uh, the, the, the diagnostic uh, you know, sequence of events and on strategies on who to test and how to test. Uh, uh, we are actually should be very fortunate. And since 2019, a lot of guidelines and guidance documents have been released uh, through the NCDC portal and Ministry of Health and Family Welfare guidelines. Uh, and Madam has also already been on the technical panel of all these, <clears throat> uh, all these uh, panels with all these guidelines. And um, uh, before that, uh, these kind of guidelines did not exist. So we were like mainly we were in a lot of dark, and we did not know where to you know how to. So now treatment algorithms are now fairly uh, clear, and uh, they are like uh, una uh, they are fairly uniform also. And we also know that uh, this is primarily, uh, this is not a zoonotic infection, it's, uh, and humans are the only reservoir hosts for hepatitis B and C. So as I said, that it's a primarily, it's a parenterally transmitted viruses, both of them, and they are heavily linked with the, uh, you know, uh, poor injection strategies or the uh, poor injection safety practices. And uh, if we look at the data that was, that has been recently released in these guidelines, which are shown by Madam Boss, that approximately there are 16 billion injections are given worldwide over the year, out of which 40% are unsafe. And out of which 85 to 90% are given for therapeutic purposes, uh, 5 to 10% for immunization. And this, these unsafe practices, they primarily lead to around uh, 2,60,000 HIV infections in India. That's approximately 5% of the global load, 21 million HBV infections, and approximately 2 million HCV infections. That's 40% of the global load. In India per year, so that's that's a huge uh, you know uh, issue when it comes to uh, you know poor injection or poor uh, you know uh, if you're not uh, giving the following the injection safety protocols. There was this very interesting uh, publication that uh, in in 2021 that was released uh, that you no know, that related the global burden of acute viral hepatitis and what is the association with the socioeconomic development status. So as uh, this uh, publication. Uh, had said that you know uh, uh, the the lowest burden of acute viral hepatitis is uh, normally seen in uh, is normally seen in countries uh, lowest burden seen in the rich countries or uh, those who have got a very high GDP and uh, they this particular paper it related uh, the the socio developmental index of the uh, country along uh, with the uh, you know, burden and prevalence of the disease and it was found that you know. Uh, uh, they, they, they related these community surrogate markers to identify what are the populations at risk. So uh, the countries which have got a poor GDP or their, we can say the third world countries or the poor countries have got a maximal risk of hepatitis uh, uh, infections, not only just because of probably because of the poor infrastructure in health sector and also the uh, poor immunization coverage for hepatitis B. So if you see this, uh, 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 this chart or this uh, map, uh, global map that just highlights all the hepatitis viruses, hepatitis A, B, C, and E <clears throat> over here. So you can see the, the parenteral uh, viruses, that is C, uh, that is B and C, they are slightly, uh, the incidence is lesser as compared to the orally transmitted viruses, that is A and E. And overall, the 
incidence of hepatitis B is falling over the years over here, as we can see. And what we call as the, uh, the disability adjusted uh, life uh, also has been falling as compared to what was there previously. Uh, if we come on to specifically for hepatitis B or acute hepatitis B, we can see that the African uh, continent is really badly affected. And uh, you know, countries like Somalia and Ghana and all these countries are very badly affected. And if we see the, uh, the overall uh, incidence rate is much higher in males as compared to females, even though the, the, you can see the fall in the graph uh, uh, over the years. And of course, the DALY also has been improving to you know, le like lesser amount of, uh, because of improvement in the uh, healthcare overall in, uh, uh, has improved definitely. So based on the prevalence of the hepatitis B surface antigen, that is the, uh, you can say the serological marker uh, for the presence of the disease. We can say that whenever it is more than 8% is considered to be high. When it's two to 7%, it's considered to be intermediate and it's low if it is less than two. So our country, it falls in the intermediate range uh, with an approximate uh, incidence of, uh, sorry, prevalence of around, around 4%. And uh, uh, the hepatitis B surface antigen positivity in general population ranges from you know around one percent to twelve percent, with average around three to four percent in our country. The uh, the core antibody, which is the hepatitis B core antibody, that uh, basically uh, tells us the prevalence uh, of the uh, epidemiological the epidemiological marker of the disease in in a community, and it's estimated to be around you know point zero nine to fifteen percent. And uh, that means approximately six to 12 million people are uh, you know, living with hepatitis, this thing. And India harbors around uh, 10 to 12% of the entire pool of hepatitis B carriers in the world and uh, around 40 million hepatitis B uh, uh, virus carriers. Then of course, we have the different uh, serotypes and the genotypes which are prevalent in India. Uh, depending on what kind of genotypes, normally there are four genotypes, but in India, uh, South and East India have got a similar uh, serotype uh, 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 you know, picture that the ADR type and the AYW type is uh, present in the North and the West India. And genotypes are the commonest one that we have in India is the type B followed by type A. Uh, the situation, like I said, in India, we are uh, intermediate of, we are of intermediate endemicity with uh, approximately uh, 50 million uh, cases of uh, chronic hepatitis B uh, virus and 11% uh, of the total global burden after China, which is around 30%. And the highest prevalence uh, that we can see is among the, in the Andaman uh, and the Arunachal Pradesh and majorly in the tribal areas, which are the maximum affected around 90% are affected with hepatitis B infections. This equally primarily uh, it uh, includes uh, hepatitis B viruses uh, causing hepatitis cell carcinoma and uh, you know, around 10 to 20 percent cases they develop uh, liver cirrhosis. Uh, hepatitis B followed by hepatitis C that is uh, um, causes the maximum uh, you know, chances of getting a chronic hepatitis and uh, in post transfusion hepatitis the chances are uh, uh, you know, uh, much much higher in hepatitis B as compared to hepatitis C. And uh, HBV and HIV co-infection is also uh, quite become common because of the similarity in the risk factors associated with both of them, uh, with uh, much higher prevalence in the sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, when it comes to your uh, hepatitis C virus, as you can see over here, uh, the incidence is very high in, again, in Africa, particularly in Egypt, and in, in Asia, it is particularly seen in Mongolia. And when it comes to the uh, the, the highest number of uh, you know, uh, uh, loss of life years, the disability uh, years lost, which can be seen in uh, this, in Pakistan and again in Somalia and some of the African countries, you can see the uh, high DALYs also. Recently, in this, these guidelines only, one uh, meta-analysis was published. A very interesting meta-analysis was published when they screened for uh, hepatitis C. Uh, uh, viral hepatitis C in India and they, when they did community-based studies, they found uh, approximately 0.85% uh, pool prevalence uh, in, in community-based studies. And when they started to look at probably uh, those groups which can represent the communities like healthy blood donors, which are again primarily their males, uh, that would be one, uh, you know, one confounding factor is 
they found around 0.44% uh, pool prevalence in males 1.3 1 1% around in females and when when they started looking at hepatitis screening camps they found around 0.61% uh, then there is a group of uh, uh, of people of uh, patients which have got a higher than normal risk of hiv co infections hiv infection of uh, sorry hepatitis c infections like for example people living with hiv they've got 3.51% uh, 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 you know pool prevalence rate uh, people with the uh, immunodeficiencies have got very very high around 44 45% uh, hepatitis c uh, infections uh, multiple transfusions stds uh, high risk sexual behaviors all these cases are uh, associated all these are risk factors which are associated with higher amount of hepatitis c so if we are looking at certain surveillance programs so this is the uh, group that needs to be you know uh, targeted the most and as i said that uh, the trial populations and slum dwellers they also have got a very high percentage of hepatitis c as well uh, that was just a very brief uh, talk about the burden of hepatitis b uh, and c uh, burden in, in our country uh, thank you so much for your time and patience Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Ardi. Thank you. Community and I just find out, you know. Uh, I guess my voice was not audible when I shared the screen. I'll, uh, I apologize. My voice was, I think, not audible when I introduced Dr. Rajiv Arvind. Uh, sir is additional professor and head, Department of Community and Family Medicine, Ames Mangalgiri. Sir uh, is having more than 25 years of experience in teaching and has served previously in KMC Mangalore and Pushpagiri Institute of Medical Sciences, Kerala. Sir has uh, published multiple uh, articles in various reputed national and international journals, is member of editorial board, Journal of Research in Medical Education and Ethics, and Pushpagiri Medical Journal. Sir has been a resource person in various national and international forums, and the area of interest are application of IT in medicine, e-learning, and clinical research. With this, I welcome Dr. Rajiv Varvadakshan, sir, for his talk today. Over to you, sir. Allow me to share the screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, again, uh, uh, today is a day of technical glitches. Uh, we are facing some problems in sharing and all that. But uh, the important point is, I am unable to start my uh, camera also, sorry. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible, sir.
Am I audible? Uh, Dr. Namrita, I request to please allow Dr. Rajiv Arvindikshan, sir, uh, to share the screen. So, share the screen from uh, his end. Dr. Rajiv, could you please uh, try sharing the screen? It has been, all the access have been permitted from our end. Dr. Rajiv, kindly also unmute yourself so we, we may try and assist you. Dr. Rajiv, requesting you to kindly unmute your mic so that we may assist you with any glitches that you are having. Right. Also, you have been given the access rights for sharing the screen. Alternatively, uh, Dr. Sir, Arti, yeah. Maybe you, miss, you may share, you can share his presentation in case if you have it with you and then sir can uh, navigate through the, your yeah, screen. Yeah. So meanwhile, I'll just take two minutes before we start. Meanwhile, you can so, uh, talk to audience for a moment about the survey links, pre and post survey links. Sure. To all our uh, audiences, uh, the, the two links would be shared. For now, the link that you see uh, visible in your chat boxes are for the pre-webinar survey. It is important that you fill in your responses in the pre-webinar survey and submit it to us. During the panel discussion, we'll be sh sharing the post-webinar survey as well. There are two links that will be shared. The first has already been uh, shared in your chat boxes. Kindly take some time to fill in your responses. It will take about more not more than two or three minutes of your time so while we wait for our next speaker to join in you may take this use this time and fill in your responses for those who have not submitted it yet during the panel discussion we'll be sharing the post webinar survey link uh, only after you have submitted both the links you will be able to generate your e certificates which will be shared in your email boxes And also, if you have any queries related to the sessions, I request that you kindly locate the Q&A box in your uh, Zoom control uh, panel. Post your queries related to the session only in the Q&A boxes for the speakers and the panelists to uh, uh, address your queries. In case if you have any general queries, you might just post them in the chat boxes related to the pre and the post webinar survey that we would look forward to helping you with. Yeah, Dr. Namrata just gave us just one minute more. And I hope the participants are uh, getting a, a new outlook for national hepatitis, vitamin B, um, sorry, hepatitis B and C uh, concepts. Because the, when I was doing my post-graduation and availability of these RDT kits at our peripheral health centers, Especially HCV, uh, hepatitis C was uh, not that common. Uh, though I did my post-graduation from uh, Renaud Institute, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. So if their peripheral centers were not having such kits, so I really, I, I appreciate the entire team if we can have it uh, across India now. Uh, so I'll uh, 
So we have with us Dr. Rajiv, sir. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, my previous speakers have already covered comprehensively about the problem of hepatitis B and C in our country, like Dr. Arthi also was telling. And I mean, we have never come across the uh, problem in its entirety, except in personal anecdotes, you know, which were very painful to start with. You know, I'll just uh, run through uh, some of my uh, thoughts about transmission and prevention of hepatitis B in the community uh, from the point of view of sustainable development goals, three point three to be exact, we actually expect to combat hepatitis. And like uh, my previous speakers were talking about, we want to eliminate hepatitis C and we want to uh, see a complete reduction in the prevalence and incidence of hepatitis B and the deaths which are related to all these things. And like uh, it has been already uh, elaborated, hepatitis B and C is the blood bone trans uh, transmitted component of hepatitis in our community, hepatitis B being the DNA virus and the hepatitis C being the RNA virus uh, uh, as we know it. And then we also know that, you know, even though the, uh, the incidence of hepatitis B is on the lower side in the newborns and children, they are the ones which are actually etiologically contributing to the maximum number of uh, hepatitis B carriers and chronic hepatitis B, as uh, uh, Dr. Sumit Rai also pointed out, because you know these viruses tend to uh, have a great affinity for the childhood uh, age. And then even though the uh, infection rates are uh, say up to 80, 90% of the overall load of hepatitis B and C in the country, they hardly become, you know, like uh, less than 5% of them only will become chronic carriers of the uh, virus and uh, it'll lead on to uh, cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma respectively. But then uh, that being said, the adults have got actually a higher amount of risk factors in terms of, uh, 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 you know, turning into the chronic carriers because of their uh, some of the personal characteristics, you know, like, you know, injection uh, use and, uh, you know, going for tattooing and going for so many other things like, you know, the circumcision, acupuncture, which is not cleanly done, ear piercing, you know, all the, all the kind of things in Indian can actually lead to the uh, infection being spread in a very silent, but in a huge fashion. And we were not hearing about the prevention of hepatitis B and C for a long time. We were more worried about hepatitis A and E because they are widely prevalent, they are hyperendemic, and these things actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, smolder under the big burden of uh, the waterborne or the foodborne hepatitis as it were. And parental transmission being the major uh, contribution to the uh, infection, and when it comes to infants and all that, we are worried about the mother to child transmission of hepatitis B and C, and then uh, especially hepatitis B. And that's where you know we are paying attention because you know for no, none of their fault, the infants are turning into hepatitis B positive and they tend to become carriers more often than not. And then that also is associated with the uh, hyper infectious status of mothers who carry hepatitis E antigen in their blood compared to the normally hepatitis B uh, surface antigen positivity in mothers and all that. So the specific test, which is not mentioned in the national program, probably the hepatitis E antig antigen uh, 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 incidence uh, is actually a little more etiologically more related to uh, carriage and uh, more complications in later life in terms of uh, children. And then one more thing, you know, the adults get into is the sexual transmission route, okay? Uh, here is where, you know, I want to stress something, you know, because, you know, we say that when it comes to HIV and all that, we say only sexual transmission route is the most important thing. You don't have to worry about hugging people, you know, kissing people or, or uh, contamination with saliva and all that. But if you take into account hepatitis B and less so C and HIV, of course, you know, HIV uh, not being the part of uh, today's discussion, even saliva can be a carrier uh, for hepatitis B. In fact, you know, I've been uh, taught and told that, you know, 50% of the people who are positive for hepatitis B, they don't know how they got it. You know, it, it shows that, you know, the, the way, the, the, the thousand-fold transmission of hepatitis B as compared to HIV and all that. So even though our education to uh, uh, create less care in the community against HIV and all that, probably we went wrong when we actually diluted the importance of bodily contact you know, including the salivary contact and other kind of contacts, which we've been talking about when it came to hepatitis B. Probably we let it slide and we 
accelerated the spread of hepatitis B in the community uh, in that sense. Okay, even in children who are above the age of say uh, one year, you know, up to five years of preschoolers and all that, you know, they tend to play a lot. That they come into collision a lot. They play uh, in uh, you know very uh, violent fashion, and they can actually also transmit the infection as it were. In fact, living together with hepatitis B uh, in the same room, you know, uh, was found to be uh, you know risky for even transmission of the uh, virus in in in, in the sense that you know. We tend to sometimes wrongly use their, you know, toothbrushes or maybe shaving razors or even the sharp combs, probably which you are using to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, keep your hair clean and uh, neat and all that. Maybe if it is sharp enough, you know, even that 0.001 ml of blood which is transmitted uh, through these kind of things can actually. Uh, potentially be transmitting the hepatitis B. So we need to have a lot of education. We were worried about barber shops. We have found in our know, laboratories who uh, repeatedly use the same uh, uh, needles and all that, for uh, taking samples and all that. These were all found to be a uh, causative uh, uh, reason for localized epidemics in many places of the country. So we know that you know these kind of things are much more common when it comes to hepatitis B as compared to hepatitis, uh, hepatitis C or even HIV. And then we got the vaccine. When we were uh, postgraduate students, and uh, the uh, vaccines came up. You know the uh, vaccines in a sense initially it was plasma derived vaccine okay we were a little concerned about that plasma component of that vi vaccine and all that people are not very much happy to take plasma derived vaccine and then all of a sudden the r dna vaccine the recombinant dna vaccine in the form of engerix b came in though it was costly even that uh, each dose cost around 300 rupees at that time and then the three doses were mandatory so you know it was a bit costly for the average people and later on we found uh, revolutions happening in the field of genetic recombinant technology and all that the viral uh, the, the vi vaccine uh, uh, cost came down to almost 40 rupees thanks to shanta biotech uh, company in uh, hyderabad and all that okay then it was a total revolution and now we have vaccines which are you know erroneously called pentavalent it's not really a, it's a combination vaccine containing many uh, components like DPT, hepatitis uh, A, uh, hepatitis B, and hemophilus influenza B. In fact, we have a hexavalent vaccine as well, you know, which includes the inactivated polio component also nowadays, you know, which can be given in one shot to the children uh, or infants so that, you know, they don't have to experience multiple pricks and all that, except when we are talking about the birthing, birthing the at-birth dose, which has to be given using the single hepatitis B vaccine, which is made for the particular purpose. And the DPD vaccine, you know, obviously, uh, is all covered up in Penta vaccine and Hexa vaccine nowadays. You know, the Penta vaccine is given only uh, uh, six and ten and fourteen weeks. And later on, you uh, give DPT separately and hepatitis B single dose. You know, which is given at birth for the uh, infants and all that. But the coverage is not something to be very proud of. So we need to focus on, you know, the initial immunization at birth of infants and especially those. Uh, uh, children, bo infants born to mothers who are already positive, and I focused on the hepatitis, uh, sorry, the HBE antigen component of the uh, mother, you know, which can be hyper uh, infectious to the infants and all that. So we, in India, we are actually over cautious. We are starting with, we are trying to increase the percentage of people who are getting uh, uh, the hepatitis B vaccine at birth. And then, you know, you're giving 6, 10, and 14 week doses. And in fact, you know, so we are ending up with four doses, in fact, you know, rather than the three doses which are uh, followed in some other countries and all that, okay? So we are taking extreme precautions. Only thing is the coverage is not something which is uh, uh, very uh, 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 acceptable or probably, you know, people are not going for it, you know, so you see that around 39, 40% of the coverage is only there for the at birth dose. And, you know, even the other doses are actually uh, with Penta vaccine, it is increasing to the level of 80, 90% and all that we actually want to reach it up to more than 90, 90% so that all the killer diseases can be at one shot uh, through mission interest and other initiatives in the country can be taken care of. Okay, because our country is in the moderate uh, endemic uh, zone for hepatitis B and all that, the thrust on this particular program has been a little on the backside uh, until ILBS came up and then uh, came up with all this uh, national program initiatives where when you tend to diagnose more of the cases, you tend to treat more of the cases, you prevent, and in fact, you boost the uh, amount of vaccination uh, coverage in the country and all that. So we are, as of now, kind of, you know, trying to promote four-dose schedules. And for the adults, 
because their uptake of the uh, vaccination uh, in terms of zero conversion and all is on a lower side. You know, we are going for a redo schedule, the zero, one, and six month. Uh, this thing, and in fact, uh, like uh, our director sir was pointing out, we actually were giving our hepatitis B shots to our uh, uh, students, and then we found out that even you know, my own personal experiences, uh, I was only lucky to get <laughs> doses while I was the postgraduate uh, student, and then later on, I uh, completed post graduation and came off. You know, I did not bother to take the third dose, and then recently, when I tested the antibody levels, it is still on a very high side. In fact, two doses can give you up to ninety-five percent. Protection. Okay, with three doses, you can make it almost uh, a certainty that you know 98%, 99% of the people will be you know, converted, zero converted. They'll have protective levels of antibody, which is more than 10 um, uh, MIU uh, per ml. You know, I mean, that, that kind of levels, you know, which is required for absolute protection that can be ensured by three doses. In fact, you know, we our uh, old teaching was, you know, there was a booster also after five years and all that. Nowadays, we are not talking about the booster doses. And then there is a doubt about you know whether uh, prematurely born infants should be given you know the vaccine or not. Definitely, they have to be given the vaccine. Probably, you can count it as a zero dose and uh, continue with the three doses later on. And uh, uh, you know these are the extra precautions which you can take in terms of community control of hepatitis B. Of course, hepatitis C doesn't have a vaccine. You are totally depending upon the new directly acting antiviral therapy, which Madam had uh, 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 in detail ex uh, explained in the. Uh, a presentation of hers. Okay, so when it comes to you know uh, again uh, we're talking about uh, the uh, safety and acceptability of uh, pentavalent vaccine, we know that pentavalent vaccine is extremely safe. It uh, generally doesn't cause much of you know adverse events and all that. And uh, kids are actually happy that you know. In fact, you know, I mean, uh, you can't take their opinion, but kids are in fact happy that you know they are suffering only one uh, dose of the uh, vaccine, one injection. That is, you know, uh, for all that. Uh, uh, five diseases and that too on a very uh, friendly area, which is anterolateral aspect of the mid thigh, you know, which uh, we uh, tend to use uh, for injection of DPT as well. Okay, so when it comes to uh, the spread of uh, the uh, infection through syringes, that's where our immunization campaigns and even the hepatitis uh, control program should be taking and uh, is taking a lot of initiative in that, you know, we are using auto disabled syringe so that the repeat use of syringes can be completely avoided. I don't know what happened with COVID uh, vaccination and all that. Okay, we've been uh, seeing a lot of millions and crores of injections being handed out in the form of vaccine and all that uh, in this uh, pandemic era. And we hope that the injection safety has been uh, the prime concern because of our previous experience with, you know, repeated use of uh, the same syringe and even uh, the waste management practices where in the, uh, the thrown syringes were uh, taken by the scavengers and repacked in very unhealthy uh, surroundings and given back for the repeat injections and all that, we were, you know, kind of worried about hepatitis B and C uh, very much in the past uh, in terms of those issues. And then, of course, coming back to the occupational safety as uh, healthcare personnel, we are at extreme risk of actually getting hepatitis B or even C for that matter. And of course, you know, I mean, the, spe uh, the specific people who are especially exposed will be the people who are actually uh, helping in dialysis, you know, in fact, the dialysis patient should be getting uh, 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 a well-deserved uh, thrust in the program so that, you know, even before they are going in for dialysis, probably they should be protected against hepatitis B and hepatitis C should be screened uh, periodically and they should be uh, given uh, adequate treatment whenever, you know, uh, they've been found to be having uh, the infection, active infection. And uh, as healthcare personnel also, the people who are involved in such intensive uh, therapy like dialysis and all that, they should be ultimately protected and they should have uh, prior doses of vaccination and then, of course, screening uh, programs in place so that, you know, the hospital spread of the nosocomial spread of uh, hepatitis B and C can be kept to a minimum. It's not totally uh, avoidable, you know, sometimes, you know, even, you know, we will have exposure, unfortunate exposure and all that. And just like a newborn who is born to an HBEAG positive uh, mother, uh, the health workers also should be protected with a combined uh, uh, strategy for immunization, which is actually, you know, uh, it's a luck factor that, you know, we can combine hepatitis B vaccine with hepatitis B immunoglobulin, even though it's uh, on a costlier side. But then the primary concern is that after the exposure, that is after the birth or after the needle uh, uh, prick or uh, any other kind of body fluid uh, contamination of the body, you know, ideally the hepatitis B immunoglobulin should be given within six hours uh, not more than 48 hours 
that is something like two days. Okay, so the dose is 0.05 to 0.07 ml per kilogram body weight. And in fact, if you are uh, very thorough, you have to give two doses of that 30 days apart. Hepatitis B immunoglobulin provides uh, protection up to about 30 days. And you have seen a detailed table which Madam showed initially about the program uh, uh, targets. 2020, we had a target, you know, which probably uh, could not be. Uh, uh, focused upon because of all our pandemic situation and all that. By, by 2030, we want to put 90% of uh, people on hepatitis B vaccination uh, with three doses, the infants. And then, of course, you know, hepatitis B uh, prevention of mother to child transmission should be instituted in 90% of the uh, infants. Blood safety should be 100%. Injection safety should be uh, completely, you know, it, there should not be any unsafe injections at all. And there is a strategy known as harm reduction among people who inject drugs. We want to provide them with safe syringes and needles. Right now, probably in 2015, the baseline now values were like 27 syringes and needles set could be provided to them, you know, uh, from our uh, point of view. But then we wanted to make it up to 200 in 2020. And by 2030, we want to give up to 300 uh, pairs of syringes and needles for those people so that they tend to have a better habit, you know, even though they can't kick the, kick the habit, we want to reduce their harm by uh, giving clean sets of syringes and needles and all that. Testing should be improved, 90% of hepatitis B sh uh, should be diagnosed, hepatitis C also should be diagnosed to the same level, and out of those people found out, you know, right now the rate of uh, Target is 65% of those uh, should be put on treatment and all that. But then by 2030, we want to put 80% of both hepatitis B and C people to be put on treatment. So this is our ambitious target by 2030, SDG uh, coinciding with it. And then for the general people, uh, the kind of advice which uh, started off with Dean, sir, you know, who talked about, you know, hand hygiene, safe uh, injection practices, safe handling and disposal of sharps and ways and comprehensive harm reduction uh, services, which we mentioned about donated blood, completely safe, and of course, training of health personnel to avoid all this kind of exposure and promoting and preventing, uh, uh, you know, promoting the use of condoms and preventing uh, unsafe sex, which is also a major reason for a transmission. In fact, hepatitis B is one of those infections which is characterized as a sexually transmitted disease, uh, hepatitis C uh, notwithstanding. We were uh, so terrified about hepatitis C when it, started off its, uh, its uh, small time outbreaks and all that because it was much more virulent compared to hepatitis B and hepatitis B had a vaccine to depend upon. And of course, interferon is out of treatment and all that. But right now, hepatitis C is eminently treatable. We have this directly acting antivirals for that particular purpose. And that's the situation where we are seeing over here. And then like Madam was telling, uh, the, there are no, uh, model treatment centers in Andhra Pradesh, all across Andhra Pradesh, you know, starting with uh, Andhra Medical College. And uh, right in the middle, we have Guntur Medical College. And uh, if you go south, you know, you have Tirupati, uh, the uh, Swims uh, Hospital, you know, over there, you know. So these three are actually uh, uh, designated centers for uh, taking care of, you know, complicated patients and all that. And of course, we have to bring down the screening to community health centers or even uh, health and wellness centers using the RDTs, which uh, uh, was mentioned. One uh, for hepatitis B, the antigen testing, and for hepatitis C, the antibody testing. At least the minimum level of you know, uh, care should be provided for uh, finding out the maximum number of patients you know, in the high-risk groups, which uh, Tumit Sura is kindly uh, highlighting. And the blood and organ donors should be screened for hepatitis uh, uh, B, uh, surface antigen, and all the blood-borne pathogens you know, should be targeted for uh, prevention as per uh, WHO's recommendation. And then at the personal level, the request is do not share razors, do not share toothbrushes. Uh, if possible, try and avoid, you know, even sharing combs, you know, which are especially sharp. And of course, you know, pay attention to which barbershop you're going, you know, for uh, uh, deep shaving and that kind of uh, um, uh, practices, which are probably dangerous when it comes to uh, transmission of these uh, deadly viruses. So that's where I stop. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, the organizers. ILBS and all the eminent personalities who are on the uh, webinar. I'm sorry for the technical glitch uh, which happened today. So uh, there I rest my case. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, with this, uh, we have handed the ended over with the individual sessions by the speakers, and we will move on to the panel discussion. 
all the audience if they you have any uh, queries questions please post it in the chat box i request all the panelists to please uh, switch on your cameras i invite dr shiv kumar uh, sarin sir vice chancellor ilbs professor dr mukesh tripathi sir director aims mangalgiri dr ekta gupta ma'am from ilbs dr sumit rai sir and dr R rajiv arvind akshram sir for the panel discussion uh dr uh, uh, shiv kumar sarin sir will uh, is unable to join us for, for today because of his busy schedule uh we uh, our warm greetings to the sir so the forum is open for the audience if you audience have any queries they can please put it in the chat box or they can raise their hands so we have over question here uh, one uh, one participant wants to know that what is the tentative cost of these uh, rdt kits for hepatitis b and hepatitis c testing i'll request uh, dr ekta gupta ma'am uh, will you like to address the query ma'am okay uh i hope i am audible so the tentative cost of rdt uh, ranges from 20 rupees per test to about 100 rupees per test depending upon um, uh, the companies but usually um, uh, a good uh, rapid diagnostic test which has a, a good uh, sensitivity so in rdt we focus more on the sensitivity not specificity should cost about 40 to 50 rupees uh hbs uh, ag is much cheaper than hcv uh, rapid card test oh thank you ma'am so we have another question from another participant uh, they are asking about what about the sensitivity and specificity for these rdt kits ma'am so actually uh, yes you are very right although um, the w uh, who guidelines says that any assay which you use for blood bank screening should have a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of more than 98% and uh, we get uh, kits approved by cds co and uh, dcgi which are present in the market but personally when you are using a rapid diagnostic test we have done a lot of studies and published the sensitivity comes close to 70 to 80% if it's a very good rdt so chances that nearly 30% of infection you might miss but the thing is that when you are doing a public health approach so the cost of an elisa or a clia based assay is uh, much higher so for an elisa based uh, testing first of all you need to collect the sample send it to a lab the lab should have infrastructure so when you want to offer screening to large number of people we recommend using rdts uh, the uh, on their kits Uh, literature it's always mentioned hundred percent and ninety eight ninety more than ninety percent. But in my personal experience, the HBS AG RDTs are close to ninety percent in their sensitivity. But antibody based RDTs for HCV come about sixty to seventy percent only in their sensitivity. Ah, uh, thank you, ma'am. So, uh, are there RDT kits for hepatitis A, E, and uh, uh, other hepatitis also, ma'am? yeah there are igm based uh, rapid diagnostic tests but i think one or two companies uh, which are available i have um, uh, personally seen but their performance is not that good so uh, since a and e are more for epidemiological data collection 
uh, we are not um, forcing at the district level labs or district centers for a and &E because a and &E can be diagnosed with your acute jaundice and uh, LFT deranged. Uh, you know, in an adult, the acute uh, viral hepatitis is usually by E and in children, it's usually by A. But yes, um, and so a and &E, we do not uh, uh, refer, they're not very good RDTs available in my uh, personal experience, although they are available in India. So we have uh, another question, ma'am. Uh, if uh, they are saying, if we have RDT at uh, in a, a peripheral health center, then uh, we don't have LFT there, or then anyhow we have to refer the patient. So yeah, like what is so the added what... advantage? So I have said, no, that uh, uh, the district centers would be treatment uh, uh, drug dispensing sites. So once the person, which person, which uh, treatment, it has to be a basic uh, biochemistry lab and an ultrasound facility should be available, which will be at the district level labs. Sub-districts will be only for giving the treatment and follow-up. They can do RDT screening. For any uh, treatment, you as it is have to do an HBV DNA, HCV RNA, which we are not accept, expecting that it will be at a sub-district. You have to refer the patient to a district hospital for an RNA test, liver function test, and a basic ultrasound or a fibroscan, which is going, which, and in this program, we are not going to provide any equipment or anything. So unlike NACO HIV program, this is not going to support you in terms of the equipment, infrastructure, manpower. They are only going to reimburse the cost of the reagents and give you drugs. This, this I'm sorry if I did not make it clear. So you can only avail free drugs and whatever reagents and all you have, you can reimburse from the state government for that. So no manpower, no And one, another question which has come up is, does hepatitis B infection spread uh, through saliva or not? Yes, uh, in saliva, you do get HBSAG and HBV DNA. So because it's a blood-borne virus, so it is present. But uh, uh, through saliva, we anticipate uh, transmission of the virus into your GI tract mucosa, that is gastrointestinal. There, you, uh, the virus will not, unless you have breach, ulcers, blood, active ulcers there. So they, from the saliva, and the saliva is touched onto your mucous membranes from there, the entry route should be through blood in your body. So yes, saliva can be there, but uh, percentage transmission uh, of uh, HBSAG from saliva through the various studies have shown very, very less. Uh, we also have with us uh, Professor Dr. Umesh Kapil, sir, on the panel. Sir is actually the backbone for this entire event. Uh, meanwhile, we have another uh, uh, Dr. Umesh Kapil, sir. I request you to please join the panel. Uh, meanwhile, uh, can I have a small query uh, from Ipta, ma'am? Yeah, Sumit, yes. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Nice to see you after a long, long time. Uh, Same uh, One question, ma'am, since I'm pretty naive to virology, frankly speaking, I just wanted to know. Uh, what uh, are the quality control measures uh, one should follow uh, for these rapid diagnostic tests? That is one thing. And the second is that since most of these tests would be available in the peripheral centers, who would be the signatory authority to validate these reports? Uh, so these uh, rapid diagnostic tests, the quality control is that uh, each SA comes with their control and test lines so that one has to do an observation this thing and ideally once you open one particular batch that day you have to have a positive control and no negative uh, control with you with, with which that particular batch that you have opened should be tested the signatory authority uh, uh, is can be the medical officer in charge of that sub-district center we have not under this program because since this is not going to be the primary assay for initiation because RNA DNA has to be signed by microbiologist, but these RDTs can be done by a simple medical officer uh, at these. And, and uh, like NACO, is there any sequence of uh, more sensitive tests being done earlier and followed by specific RDTs? No, there is no strategy of testing here. It's very simple algorithm, which I've shared 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, another question which we have here is like, what is the cost of hepatitis C treatment uh, for the combined drug regimen? If we go for a 12 weeks put, uh, treatment protocol or a 24 week uh, treatment protocol? So it is free right now okay. in, under the national program. So the drugs are there and uh, state, you uh, just can procure them. Otherwise, um, I'm not very sure that right now, what is the sofosubivir and velpatasvir uh, or daclatasvir cost for a 12-week uh, regime? It's uh, not very high. But under this program, the drugs and the drugs are going to be procured by uh, national level and they will be sent to the state level. And then the state health authority will take control in charge of these drugs. So it will be free, free of cost. Uh, I have a doubt uh, from my side, ma'am. Like when we start NACO, ART or anything, they look uh, for a space, particular setup, uh, which the hospital should give. Uh, so is that similar thing uh, expected or it's like a PPP model where these drugs can be kept at pharmacy level or a laboratory level at Cardities? Yeah, so the unlike NACO program, here this program is not controlled by a separate division or a ministry. Here we are giving an option to each state that um, you identify your model treatment centers, your district level sub-district centers where RDTs will be kept and where drugs can be kept and identify your state lab and your uh, medical college where uh, complicated cases are going to be dealt with. Now that depends upon that individual. They are not going to give you any equipment, any manpower. So that depends upon your individual in uh, director or dean, that wherever, whosoever they make a nodal officer. So the drugs, uh, uh, ideally, the, it requires a room temperature storing only. The RDTs are also the room temperature storing can be kept. So you need to have in each site some nodal officer and then make like, I can tell you for what we are doing in Delhi. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we unfortunately Delhi uh, runs with two governance system like one is the uh, central government through the secretariat yes. and the other is the state so we uh, are finding it difficult but here we have identified uh, what are the district hospitals where the RDTs will be kept in fact all the Mohalla clinics uh, they have kept it now identifying where to refer for uh, uncomplicated cases are the 11 districts in Delhi and 11 uh, sites have been identified and there the microbiology person has been made uh, the nodal officer so that they do an RNA DNA. Now the provision has been given that if you do not have, you can even send it outsource it. They are going to reimburse thousand rupees per RNA to you to your hospital. Okay. So you, if you do not have a microbiologist or lab, you can outsource to a private lab also. But the cost reimbursement will be at this rate only. And the drugs are kept at a common dispensary, and uh, the enrollment into the register has to be uh, done with the whosoever is the nodal officer. That. Uh, so my, my another doubt uh, comes as you talked about the state and central government. So if uh, one day is going about the state government, so if uh, can we directly approach to central government also for such nodal centers? Like what will be the approach? See, ideally, the, uh, your state health mission. So if you are keen, you should approach your state health mission. So this, as I told you, this program will run through state health mission. You find out that who is the nodal officer for viral hepatitis program they have already made. They must have made because in the national uh, uh, training of the trainers, uh, we have trained from each state uh, one one uh, nodal officer. So that nodal officer uh, would find out uh, and would make a plan of their own. They only have to procure drugs and reimburse the cost of uh, the reagents too. Oh, yes. so, so you should approach a state health mission. Okay. Uh, another question has come up from one of the participants. Uh, is drug resistant testing for hepatitis C treatment part of the program? Like we have yes, in, it is uh, very TV. well uh, part of the program, but only in uh, uh, complicated and drug failure cases. So I, this is a genotyping based assay when we look for these resistance associated substitutions and mutants, not proven role because there are a lot of other and we have also published a lot of literature that these uh, drug resistance uh, testing actually do not correlate with your uh, treatment failure. It is more to adherence and the social practices. So 
hepatitis C is more of a needle stick through blood borne and IV drug users. So what happens is that even if you clear the virus from them, because of their practices, they go and get so reinfection occurs in them in more. So it's not the drug resistant, but it is that so education, lifestyle changing, and counseling post uh, clearance of the virus is very very important. But drug resistance testing, if needed, uh, uh, should have should be done. Uh, but then you have to show that why it has to be a really documented, uh, 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 and this will be done at the state apex lab only. Yeah. Uh, so with this, we have ended with the questions from the audience. Uh, if anybody have any other uh, query, uh, please post it, or we will uh, close the session for the day by vote of thanks. So thank you, everybody. I, Dr. Aarti Gupta, Assistant Professor, Department of Community and Family Medicine, Ames Mangalgiri, deemed it a prestige honor to give the vote of thanks on behalf of Ames Mangalgiri. Respected President Sir, Director Sir, Dean Sir, and Honorable Faculty Member, Distinguished Resource Person, Eminent Organizing Partners, my colleagues and supporting staff, I deem it a great honor to propose the vote of thanks to all who have helped us in conducting the online webinar on advances in hepatitis B and C. Uh, first, I'd like to propose my vote of thanks to our respected director, sir, Professor Dr. Mukesh Tripathi, sir. Sir has always been a backbone to us and gives us spirit to organize such events. Next, I would like to extend my hearty gratitude to our president, sir, Dr. T.S. Ravi Kumar, sir, for constant motivation. I am extremely uh, happy to express my gratitude to Dr. Shiv Kumar Sareen, sir, for his uh, guidance and opportunity to give, conduct this event. I thank our joint organizer, ILBS, and the team from ILBS, headed by Dr. Umesh Kapil, sir, Dr. Aisha, Dr. Namrata, and others for extended support. We are grateful to our Dean, sir, Professor Joy A. Ghoshal, sir, for his presence and valuable support. I extend a hearty vote of thanks to all speakers, Dr. Rekta Gupta ma'am, Dr. Sumitra sir, and Dr. Rajiv Arvind Akshan sir for their time and ex extreme support in making this webinar successful. I also thank participants and everyone for overwhelming uh, response and making this webinar more meaningful. I'd like to thank the faculty, Department of Community and Family Medicine, Ames Mangalgiri, Dr. Dhruv Jyoti Jahar, Dr. Satinarayan S, Dr. Reddy, Dr. Yamni, Dr. Navya, Dr. Vinod, and Dr. Santosh for supporting and, and, and for supporting. I also thank uh, IT Cell for rendered support. Thank you all for the cooperation and listening. Dr. Namrata, over to you for the pledge. Thank you so much, Dr. Aarti, and also special thanks to all the speakers, very uh, nimbly and very adeptly managed the technological glitches also, and uh, quite rightly proving that the only technology that we need these times is the community and being connected. So uh, moving on to the I pledge, I pledge is a symbolic uh, gesture that we expect all of us to join and show your solidarity and support our fight against viral hepatitis. For this, I request all the panelists to kindly switch on your cameras, raise your right hand, and please repeat the oath after me. I pledge that I will try to keep my liver healthy. I pledge that I will try to keep my liver healthy. I pledge that I will get myself and my family tested and vaccinated. I pledge that I will get myself and my family tested and vaccinated. I pledge that I will generate a dialogue with my colleagues on hepatitis. I pledge that I will generate dialogue with my colleagues on dialogue with my colleagues on hepatitis. I pledge that I will teach ten people about hepatitis. I pledge that I will teach ten people about hepatitis. About hepatitis. I pledge that I will not discriminate people living with hepatitis. I will not discriminate people living with hepatitis. I pledge that I will contribute in empowering people against hepatitis. I pledge that I will contribute in empowering people against hepatitis. Thank you all.
So Thank to you. all the participants, the post uh, webinar link has also been shared in the chat boxes. Kindly make sure that you submit your responses in both the link one and link two. Follow the links. Both of them have been posted in your chat boxes. Uh, once you've submitted your responses, the email ID that you fill in in the forms would be automatically registered with us for the e uh, certificates uh, links that will be generated and sent in your email boxes. Kindly be patient with us for another three days as the certificates might take about three days time to reach your inboxes depending on the slots. So thank you all. With your permission, we, we may uh, close the webinar, Dr. Aarti. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Namrita, we can. Uh, I just request uh, if all the panelists can just switch on the cameras, I'll take one photo for purposes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Namrita, please just uh, stop your share screen, then only the photo can come. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Namrita. So we are ending the session. You can get the link uh, and certificates as told. For any queries, I'm writing one uh, email ID. I request everybody to contact on that email ID. It's in the chat, chat box. Namrata ma'am, we will end the session. Yeah, yeah we can. And, uh... For all the audiences, please do get connected with us. You might want to log on to the empathycampaign.com. There is a knowledge repository that exhaustively explains about the hepatitis. So hepatitis B and hepatitis C have been exhaustively covered. So make sure that you use that knowledge repository. And also in case of any queries regarding the e-certificates, please uh, get connected with us at webinarilbs at gmail.com. It's uh, webinarilbs at gmail.com. And we might as well post it in the chat box. And also you can uh, get in touch with the email ID that has already been posted by Dr. Aarti. So both the channels are open for you and the post and pre-webinar survey for the one last time we'll be circulating one more time in the chat boxes. And the links would be open for another 15 minutes. So make sure that you do fill in your responses. And thank you so much for getting connected with us and sparing your time. Thank you.